Yes. There we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll start from the top again so the recording gets it all. All right, so I'm Carson Thomas. I work with Montana Department of Agriculture as the nursery program specialist. That's everything from inspecting, regulating, and far beyond. Uh, here to talk about native trees and shrubs in the urban landscape. So I've just made a few selections of some popular native trees and shrubs that uh, are available in local nurseries that do well in our general urban landscape here in the, the Helena and general Montana area. So before we start talking about species, I'm going to talk a bit about the general benefits of planting native species over you know, uh, non-native species. So one of the main benefits of a native species is that they're already acclimated to our region. Anyone who's lived in Montana for any amount of time knows we have some pretty wild weather. So here's a picture of May 21st of last year when we had a sudden snowstorm and got about eight inches of snow. And I believe it was about 70 degrees the week before that and gorgeous and sunny. As you can see by my mountain ash tree out there, it's all leafed out and ready for summer. And then surprise, here's a giant snowstorm. And so the native plants did just fine. It didn't shock them at all. They made it through the season. We lost a few uh, other annuals, vegetables, and perennials, but you know that's about to be expected. But the, all the, the natives and the relatives of the natives did just fine. In general, native varieties are uh, more pest resistant. And that's not to say that pests don't harm them, but all of our native pests, they're more likely to rebound from any damage those pests cause because, you know, the simple way to put it is they grew up together. So they've made it this far, they know how to tolerate that. And as you can see by the lower portion of that mountain ash, it's been pretty heavily browsed by our favorite native pest here, the mule deer. And really they did some help with uh, uh, structural pruning down there. So I guess I can kind of thank them a little bit much of a pain in the butt as they are. Uh, generally, native plants have a, a lot fewer required inputs, and that's everything from water to fertilizer to even labor as well. Uh, that mountain ash tree, I don't think we fertilize it or anything. It has a little bubbler sprinkler that gives it a little bit of water, but it does absolutely thrives on that hillside there. And one of my Personal and professional favorite benefits of native plants is you're less likely to introduce new invasive species, partly because native plants, well, they're, they're native, they're not invasive, they would really struggle to be invasive here. And if you're buying native plants, they're probably coming from a local nursery. So if that local nursery is propagating themselves, they're not importing anything, they're not going to have any hitchhiker pests. And uh, so that's just another perk there. And also, also shop local, that's just generally a good message to spread. As, we love that here in Montana as well. And another benefit of native plants is that they're favored by native pollinators. And so we all wanna save the bees. That's a very popular message right now, but some of the native pollinators that get kind of overlooked by that would be like the red-tailed bumblebee, the orchard mason bee. They're fantastic pollinators, but they don't get a lot of attention because you can't get honey from them. So they're, they're a good one to look out for. They have a lot of local benefits and they're fantastic pollinators. A single orchard mason bee can do the work of about 2,000 honeybees, so they're they're good to keep around. And other other native pollinators would like them as well, like the the rufous hunting hummingbird. They're gorgeous little birds that are a lot of fun to have around, and they particularly favor native plants because they grow up together. But we didn't come here to talk about the birds and the bees. You know, we're here to talk about plants. So I've got one more slide of some other benefits, and these are my favorite benefits, the educational benefits of native plants. And so obviously our state tree, the ponderosa pine, there's a picture on the right there of some ponderosa pines right outside our state capitol building. It's just kind of a fun image because it's, it's very Montanan right there, even with the snow. I just took that picture about a week and a half ago. Our state flower is the bitterroot, Luisia ridiviva, and that's the, the bitterroot on the bottom left, the white one there. And so beyond just knowing those significant native plants to Montana, it's also good to know the historic uses of those plants and what better source of historic uses than the Native Americans. They lived here for a very long time and figured out a lot of creative and useful ways to, uh, to utilize the native plants, everything from food to medicines to basically everything. And 
the other educational benefit, I'm a big fan of history and trivia and plants, so it's just generally a good culmination there. Uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition. It's very important to Montana's history. Uh, kind of, you can follow all of our cities is basically where they went for the most part. Some outliers like Kalispell and Whitefish there, but uh, you know they're very, very prominent. We live here in, or I live here in Lewis and Clark County, so obviously they left their mark. But uh, you can go through the National Park Service has actually made a number of Meriwether Lewis, Lewis's journals available online and they're on an interactive map so you can go along and see where all of the journal entries were made and see his descriptions of native species and what he found significant in certain areas and read all about uh, samples that he took and the really interesting thing is that Captain Meriwether Lewis he was a military man he wasn't really a trained botanist or taxonomist or anything like that but he was able to identify a lot of the native plants to the correct family and those families even stand up today. And uh, anyone who's involved in taxonomy knows that it, it changes pretty regularly. Things get shifted as they kind of observe them more, but a lot of his discoveries actually were, were correct and stay true today. So that's quite impressive. And naturally a lot of them are, are named after him, like our state flower there, Louisia, obviously comes from Meriwether Lewis. And uh, the purple flower there is Clarkia, so it's, Kind of a fun example of Lewisia and Clarkia from the Lewis and Clark expedition. And so, you know, beyond actual uses, you might be wondering, well, what, what's actually a benefit of educational benefits? And so I have this hypothetical story of, say, you're out front of your house working in your native perennial bed, and you've got your bitter roots are blooming beautifully, and some folks come walking down the street and spot your flowers and decide to ask you about them. And you can tell them, oh, well, that's our state flower, and it helped the Lewis and Clark expedition with emergency food in the winter, and, you know, it became very significant here. Uh, we've got the Bitterroot Valley, a lot of the stuff in the state is named after it, and they'll either think that's interesting and go home and set up their own beautiful native perennial bed, or they'll think you're just kind of a weird plant nerd and probably leave you alone, which is also a benefit because you don't need that kind of negativity in your life. So I've got one more little sort of divisive slide. Um, native species, they're very good. We all love native species. Sometimes they're a little bit hard to find in a nursery. So it's just kind of on your personal decision whether you wanna go for purely a native species or native variety, or if you wanna pick a horticulturally selected variety. And that's something that's specifically bred for some kind of trait or crossbred with some other maybe not native variety. And uh, really ultimately those are going to be easier to find because they're a lot easier to market and so they're a lot more available because if a nursery says oh i can sell two of the luisia cotyledon on the right for every one luisia red aviva on the left they're you know probably going to have twice as much of the one on the right and make it a lot easier to find but they'll also usually have showier qualities or more desirable traits um, so these are these are both luisia the one on the right is our personal one that I've got out in the backyard here. And, uh, you know, it's got the brighter flower. They're a little bit smaller, but very showy, different color, bigger leaves. And they're a lot easier to find. A lot more nurseries will have those versus having purely a bitter root. So it's just kind of a personal matter whether you want purely native species or if you want something that's been kind of selectively bred over the years, just easier to find. I'll leave that all up to you. So we're gonna dive right into the species next. And uh, I've got these kind of arranged tallest to smallest because there is kind of some overlap between, you know, a tree growth habit or a bush or shrub growth habit. There's, they kind of vary depending on their situation sometimes. So we'll start right in with the tallest one, which is the Ponderosa pine. Still one of my favorite scientific names because it's incredibly easy to remember. Ponderosa pine, Pinus ponderosa, there it is. Uh, they typically grow up to about 90 feet uh, out in the wild, you can find them a lot taller, but generally in the disturbed soil of an urban landscape, they'll stay a little bit shorter, which is probably for the best because, uh, well, I'll tie it into uh, the drought tolerant, we'll get there. So they're, they're tolerant of most soil types. They'll grow about anywhere in the state, especially if you care for them correctly. Uh, but with their drought tolerance, it's actually better if you don't give them much water. 
And that's because it's a very tall tree. It extends its branches out quite a bit. But if they get too much water, they'll just spread the roots out kind of flat. They won't develop that main straight down tap root. And so if they have to dig down and search for the water, they develop that tap root. And that gives a kind of a balance in a windstorm. Because if a lot of wind kicks up and it's got kind of flat roots, then we like to say that the branches like to reach for the ground and they take the trunk with it. And that's not so good. But it was officially named our state tree in 1949. That's when the legislature adopted it. It was actually selected long before that. And I believe 1908, they took a survey of Montana school children of what tree they thought was most significant for the state. And it was almost unanimous that the school children picked the ponderosa pine. So it's kind of funny to see that even kids, you know, 113 years ago thought this was a real important tree, 113-ish years ago. But they're uh, very popular with birds, especially smaller birds, songbirds, uh, chipmunks, and squirrels. And that's because bigger birds don't like to fly into these because, you know, it's pokey and big birds don't like to get poked, but the little birds can work their way in. So if you're a backyard ornithologist or a bird watcher or anything like that, a ponderosa pine might be a good choice for you because a lot of very interesting birds like to hang out in there. Next up, we've got the Plains Cottonwood, uh, Populus deltoides variety monolifera. And uh, you might notice that this isn't exactly the best picture, but it's a historically significant picture because it comes from the uh, State Foresters Report in 1916. And this, the whole report is available in the State Library. And so before I go through any of the points on the slide, I'm just gonna read a little excerpt from his report because it's quite interesting. So the state forester at the time was John C. Van Hook. And in his report, he says, the cottonwood, Populus deltoides, this fast growing short-lived tree extensively used in windbreaks because of the quick results obtained. It demands considerable moisture, but is not particular in soil requirements. The wood, though soft, is useful as fuel and for rough lumber. When buying the cuttings, always order staminate plants. These have no cotton when fully grown to litter the yard in the spring. And having been a groundskeeper, I can say that that cotton is an absolute pain in the butt to clean up. There's just no good way to do it. It gets kind of sappy. It sticks to everything. You can't mow it. You can't vacuum it, rake it. It's just a pain. So that's, that's some good advice from 1916 for you. And these are very popular trees. You'll see them all over town. Uh, he says short-lived, but that's just kind of compared to other trees. So they still get, I think there's some up by the Capitol that are probably 250 years old. Uh, they're, they're very popular shade trees. They're just hardy, you know, it, they're all over town. They're a good tree. Uh, they are fast growing. Uh, one of the fastest in North America, they can grow up to five feet a year. And it's kind of fun. I was going through some other pictures I had found. And any pictures of the same tree in the same area, you could incrementally see it getting taller. And it was just kind of neat to see. But I figured this historic picture would be kind of fun to include. Uh, popular shade tree in the summer. Uh, in that snowy picture, I don't know if you can see the background very well, but there's a lot of cottonwoods just down the hill from my house here. And so for, for more historic trivia, just to keep it interesting, uh, cowboys would make a tea from the inner bark to treat digestive issues. And this actually comes from a rather famous cowboy by the name of Charles Goodnight. He was uh, most famous recently, we'll say, for being a character in the Lonesome Dove series. And funny enough, most of the actions of the main characters in that series are based on his exploits of back in the day. Uh, he was known as the father of the Texas Panhandle. And he was one of the original donors of American bison to Yellowstone National Park. So he's one of the reasons that we still have the bison, the buffalo there today. So uh, another kind of important figure for Montana history. And, uh, we have another, another point of Montana pride with this is the US national champion. So the, the biggest known example of it is over in Ravalli County. It's just outside of Hamilton. And it is a massive and magnificent tree. I've actually seen it. I didn't know it was the national champion at the time, but then I read the article about it Sure enough, I'd seen that tree. And uh, yeah, 112 feet tall, 94 feet wide. So that shows they get a little taller than they are wide. And that kind of is their average, but that's a, a particularly good example of them. And this is actually the state tree of Kansas, Nebraska, and Wyoming. So another 
significant popular tree, popular populace, kind of funny there. So another populace is the quaking aspen. And anyone who spent much time around Helena or in the valley has seen probably a whole lot of these. They're a very popular one in the urban landscape. Typically grow up to 80 feet. You don't find a lot of examples getting that tall. Uh, mostly they stay a little bit shorter and grow with kind of that, that bunch type growth habit. They'll form thick little stands out of their sucker trees. Uh, they are tender suckers, so they're easy to mow down or to clean up, but it, it will spread. Uh, they prefer more moisture. So it's a great one for just kind of sticking in the middle of a, a manicured lawn. And that's kind of what you've got in the picture here. And I do have to apologize. I didn't plan far enough ahead. I didn't get a lot of my own pictures. So I borrowed a lot from Bugwood, which is a uh, database put on by universities and departments of agriculture and all sorts of folks, but just a, a collection of images. So I had to kind of sift through and find ones that best fit some of these slides that I didn't already have pictures for. And uh, most of my pictures are around pests and diseases now, and those aren't as fun to show off. <laughs> but it gets its name from the quaking leaves, quaking aspen. The leaves are held on a flat petiole, so even in the slightest breeze, you won't even feel the wind, but the leaves will shake. And it makes this great shimmering look to it and uh, a great kind of background noise that I don't think I could imitate well enough. It would be quite embarrassing if I tried, but they're a very popular, very fun tree. When I worked in the nursery, this was definitely the tree we sold the most of. And they get the, a bright fall color. It's definitely a stark yellow, but it really stands out. It's great to see. And uh, for a groundskeeping benefit of them, the leaves are so lightweight that they blow away. So you don't have a lot of raking to you do, but your neighbor can have some fun with them. And uh, for, for some trivia with this one, they contain salicin, which converts to salicylic acid when it's in the body. And if you're not familiar with it, that is aspirin, which gets its name from aspen. And funny enough, it's in the willow family, which is salicaceae, that gets its name from the salicin. So, or maybe vice versa there, but just a, a whole little web of connections there. Next up is another popular one that uh, you've You've probably seen if you've hung around Montana for very long, the common choke cherry, Prunus virginiana. It's one of our most popular fruits that we produce in Montana alongside say the huckleberry and the flathead cherry. And they, they do get their name because they're so tart that you choke. So add some sugar if you do anything with them. Uh, typically grow up to 30 feet when they're in their tree habit, a little bit shorter if you kind of let them go in their bush habit. You can find them in the hills in pretty much every direction from us. Uh, there's a bunch down in Nature Park that grow beautifully. They're fairly drought tolerant, the ones down in Nature Park. They get no supplemental water and they produce prolifically every year. They're gorgeous, they're fast growing. Uh, they get a neat, real dark kind of purple, smooth bark to them that even if they don't have any leaves or flowers or fruit on them, they're still interesting to look at. Uh, obviously, the flowers are beautiful and the fruit are what most people look for for making jams, jellies, pies, wines, all sorts of things. And uh, they also get the brilliant fall color, uh, usually closer to orange and red, but a lot of them will go yellow as well. There's a lot of selected varieties. I think the most popular one is probably the Canada red variety. It has that real deep burgundy leaf to it. And uh, th that was probably about the third most popular tree when I worked in the nursery. And the Native Americans used it for all manner of things from making pemmican, which is kind of a, a cured meat and fruit mix, kind of a, a trail food, uh, very culturally significant to them. They'd make a remedy out of the bark. It's very rich in antioxidants. And they would smoke the inner bark for ceremonies, but I don't know too many details about other plants that they would smoke for that. That was just one of the things listed in the, in the resources I had. But yes, the choke cherry, it's a, it's a very popular one for urban landscapes. It's hardy. There's not a lot of diseases that hit them anymore in, in the US. We've kind of eradicated the plum pox virus. I haven't found any samples of that for a, a good long time, which is very nice. Next up is the water birch. And this is a very popular stand-in for quaking aspen. It grows in very similar habits and conditions, except that it stays shorter. So if you don't have a lot of vertical space or you don't like too tall of trees, a water birch is a very good choice. 
Um, this isn't the best picture of one out there because it's a little bit washed out color wise, but they have a, a brilliant kind of cinnamon red orange bark to them. That's very interesting kind of all year round. It looks really neat in winter when it's sticking out of the bright white snow. Uh, the the multi-stemmed habit of it, you can call it a bush, a stand, a tree, a bunch of trees, whatever you want. It, it kind of reaches into those blurred lines of what's a tree and what's a bush, what's a shrub. Uh, very showy fall foliage again. They get that, that bright yellow leaf, just like the quaking aspen. Uh, they are more resistant to the bronze birch borer, which is a native pest than other birches you can get locally. Um, the European cutleaf birch is probably the most popular one because it has that bright white bark. But if you see one in town, it's almost a guarantee that you'll see that the top of it is either dead or cut off. And that's the damage of the bronze birch borer. Whereas these water birches usually can, if they get the borer, they can grow around it, basically. They can over, overcome the damage. And the Native Americans had basically cut a wound in the bark and used the sap as kind of a treatment for skin sores and things. And I haven't tried it myself, but I know that it's a very sticky sap. So it probably has some kind of soothing qualities. And uh, the resource said they use the inner bark as a source of food during times of famine, which I guess I know I'd have to be kind of really starving to think of eating the inner bark of a tree, but if it's an emergency resource, they were experts in finding that when they needed it. So very interesting bit of trivia there. Next up is another popular one, and I was happy enough to actually find a good example of these. The Rocky Mountain Juniper, uh, Juniperus scopulorum. Sorry for my Latin pronunciations. I don't speak Latin and I barely pronounce English words right sometimes. Uh, they typically grow up to about 20 feet. These are some examples up by the Capitol campus again. It's actually a lot of native trees that the landscapers are putting in up there, which is nice to see. They're kind of leaning towards that uh, local flavor to the general capital campus. They're very drought tolerant, uh, tolerate poor soils. They're just kind of very hardy. They stick with that almost uniform, perfect shape there whenever they get full grown. Uh, if you've ever done much hiking on Mount Helena, particularly around the Reader's Alley, Reader's Village area, there's a lot of them over there. And uh, one of the landscape benefits of them, you can see from the left, it kind of looks like a portion of it has died. That's actually a dogwood that's growing under it. Rather than compete with the dogwood, it just grew around it. And so they're very easy to work with and they don't typically outcompete other plants. So you can get that variety of textures going for a general, maybe a style interest. Uh, in the summer, that one does look very nice with that blooming dogwood at the base of that big juniper. It's, very interesting. And uh, they're commonly used as shelter belts. They're very wind hardy, wind resistant. And uh, I know of a few farms over, who I think it's about Fromberg, that uh, they actually have a whole hedgerow of them. And it's, it's a very well maintained hedge, but they're quite interesting to see a whole bunch of them close together. You don't see that as often. But uh, the Species name, Scopulorum, you'll see it on a couple more plants I've got in this presentation. It literally translates to of the mountains. So we have a lot of plants that the species is Scopulorum in the state that is the Spanish word for mountain. <laughs> and uh, they had many prominent Native American uses and some cowboy uses as well from the resources I had. Uh, the leaves can be boiled for a treatment for colds or fevers, and they're actually rich in vitamin C. The cones or the, the little berries is what a lot of folks call them. They're actually the cones can be boiled as a laxative. Uh, the smoke was of the leaves, you would bundle the leaves up into a little stick and the smoke was said to drive off evil spirits. So they would use it for cleansing homes. And uh, the berries were also used in pemmican just like the choke cherry. And apparently cowboys would dry and cure the berries and use it as a substitute for coffee, which I'm quite interested in trying one of these days. I never gave much thought to that, but having the, the previous bit of that they're used as a laxative kind of wards me off of that, maybe just a little bit. <laughs> so next up is another popular one, particularly known for fall color, like the picture there, the Rocky Mountain Maple. It's a shorter maple. It's not as grand as say a Norway maple or anything, 
but uh, they typically grow up to the 25 feet. They do need a little bit more moisture than most other plants. And when I say something prefers more moisture, that just means it might need a little bit of supplemental water. Um, obviously they exist in our ecosystem in general, so they're usually okay with how much rain we get, but last year is a particular example of we had a really bad drought, so it might need a little supplemental water. Uh, these grow more in that multi-stem habit, so they're a good space filler in a landscape. Um, a lot of buildings will use them off to the sides of doors uh, just to kind of fill space to the next wall or something. They get, uh, you can kind of see it on the left side of the picture, they get that bright orange uh, first year growth. And so even in the winter, it holds that color and then has that bright white bark towards the middle. So they're kind of a year round interest plant. Uh, they don't produce as good of maple syrup as other maple trees. I know a lot of people ask me that whenever we talk about maples. They're, they're not as good as a sugar maple, I can say that for sure. But they are a, a hardier maple and that makes them a good choice for Montana. Next up is another particularly useful fruit, the Saskatoon service berry. And there's a whole lot of common names for this one from sarvis berries, June berries, uh, some people just call it by the genus Amelanchier. Uh, let's just kind of go with whatever you want there. I've always known them as service berries. They typically grow up to about 12 feet. They'll fill in pretty nicely like that picture there. Uh, Multi-stem like a lot of these midsection ones. Uh, a little, bo little bit more water. Uh, they're fruit producers so you know typically you want a little bit more water. If you're growing them specifically for the fruit, you can kind of reduce water as they're maturing and it'll make the fruit just a touch sweeter. Uh, that sugar, sugar content goes up as the plant's stressed a little bit. They get very pretty bunches of white flowers and they're very fragrant. You can smell them from probably 20 feet away when there's a, a whole bush worth of flowers. There were some great examples uh, over on the MSU campus, I think it was. Uh, but uh, edible berries, uh, they're useful, similar to choke cherries, uh, you know, jams, jellies, wines, pies, all that kind of stuff. But these are a particularly popular one with the birds. So if you are growing it for the fruit and you want the fruit, it, you really got to get up early to beat the birds to the right fruit. And they, they know the moment they turn ripe, I swear. Uh, it, it also gets that bright yellow fall foliage. Uh, a lot of them will kind of get that same bright yellow color. So it's a good one to use in accent with some evergreens like the Rocky Mountain Juniper, just to get that alternating color. Uh, there I mentioned the birds and the uses of the berries. So we'll keep on moving on here. The Western and Sitka Mountain Ash. And I, I originally had these as two separate slides, but the more I refreshed on them, I found that a lot of people had been swapping the common names around. And so some people were calling Sitka mountain ash, which is typically a little shorter growing of western mountain ash, which is usually a little taller, like the one in my snowy picture at the, at the beginning. And uh, just the, the more I read about them, a lot of people really struggle to distinguish the two. They throw the names out back and forth, so we're just going to put them in one here. And they're not a true ash tree, that's why there's the hyphen between mountain and ash. Some people will combine them, some folks leave them separate, but it's not truly an ash. It's a, it's a separate genus species, I think even different family, but uh, they just have that very similar leaf structure. So it's a mountain ash, not an ash, but uh, they're a shorter growing tree. They're very hardy. They have a very interesting smooth uh, red orange bark to them. They're particularly hardy. They get very showy flowers. They're gorgeous flowers. Uh, they'll hold those bright orange berries well into the winter. Some birds like the berries pretty well, but for the most part they get left there. And then as winter progresses, any migratory birds will come and clean them up. We just recently had a huge flock of cedar wax wings come through and they were hanging out in those trees. So that was additionally fun to see. And uh, the Native Americans would eat the berries. I believe they called it chakwas, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they never seemed very palatable to me. So there probably needs to be a lot of uh, additives to make them tasty, but it's a kind of an emergency food source in that early winter period. And uh, as another fun use, uh, when I was a little 
kid running around causing trouble, I found that uh, these berries make fantastic slingshot ammo because they're they're hard enough that they fly real well, but they're not hard enough that they cause any damage. So if you if you have mischievous kids running around, this might be a good choice to to keep them from breaking things. You know, give them a little low power slingshot and they can have some fun with a bunch of berries there. Next up's the antelope bitter brush and uh, some I've seen a lot of accounts of it being bitter bush or similar words, but the one that's antelope, it's not the rabbit bitter brush, which is another similar similar plant. Uh, they're not as showy as a lot of the other species I've put on here, but they're one of the hardiest plants out there. Uh, they grow in basically desert conditions. Um, a lot of just general, you know, rocky desert images you'll see, there's probably at least one of these in that picture tolerant of a lot of soils. They do get showy yellow flowers, which you can see on kind of half of the bush in the picture, and they're a nitrogen fixer. So they'll pull nitrogen gas out of the air and make it available in the soil for other plants. So they're just generally beneficial as well. And if I remember correctly, there's actually an anecdote in, uh, I can't remember the exact location, but one of the uh, nuclear bomb testing sites that they found that the antelope bitter brush and the rabbit bitter brush had been pulling that radiation out of the soil and holding it in the plant, but it didn't affect the plant growth at all. So they're actually just filtering radiation out of the soil. So it's a, a good remediation plant. And uh, one of the native nurseries that I've worked with, they actually sell this to a lot of uh, mine reclamation sites. So it's, it's a very useful, very hardy plant, just a little bit less showy. So if you have a, a low or no maintenance zero scape garden, this is a very good choice there. This one, the silverberry, I personally am not a big fan of them, but they do serve a great purpose of being a substitute for Russian olive, which is a regulated species. We don't wanna be propagating or spreading Russian olive anymore because it propagated and spread too well on its own. It's borderline invasive in a lot of locations, choking out some river banks and things. So silverberry is a local native substitute that's significantly less invasive. It has a lot of the same showy characteristics. It doesn't get nearly as tall as Russian olives will, but that's also a benefit because Russian olives kind of fall apart easily when they get real tall. So this is just a, a stable shrub, a lot of the similar leaf structure. It's got those same little berries, the yellow flowers. It's got the, the darker wood to it, that kind of purpley bark. It attracts songbirds. And it, like the antelope bitter brush, is a nitrogen fixer. So it, it pulls that nitrogen gas out of the air and makes it available. A lot of orchards will plant them in between rows of apple and cherry trees because it's basically free fertilizer that they're just pulling out of the air. So that's a way of saving money and you know, cleaning up some air. That's a, that's a greenhouse gas you're pulling out of the air. So that's an added benefit there. And it, it carries those berries into the winter. So it also attracts a lot of the non-migratory birds, which is a, another perk for the backyard ornithologists. So we'll go to one that's a lot prettier and a lot showier. This is the Lewis's mock orange. And you'll notice that the species name Lewis eye and Lewis in the common name. This is also named for Meriwether Lewis. This is a particularly showy plant that he picked up. It's the state plant of or state flower of Idaho. Um, there's a lot of particular varieties, uh, subspecies that are named for regions of Idaho. It's another very showy one. It's very fragrant. Um, there are several excellent examples of them over at MSU and on our capital campus here that uh, once they're in full bloom, man, you can smell them from blocks away and it's just fantastic. They're, they're gorgeous. They grow in these kind of big bushy arching boughs of just filled with flowers. It's a, it's a great one for the landscape. Uh, they grow really well close to buildings as well. They'll just kind of grow out and vary the texture of your landscape. So it's a, it's a good showy option. Uh, they don't need a lot of supplemental water which is definitely a perk in drought years. And the, the Native Americans figured out that you can straighten out the stems and when they grow in the wild, they don't grow as, as big or as bowed or anything. So they, they get straighter branches and they're useful for making arrows. So just some more interesting trivia there. 
here we have the wax current which is another one if you do a lot of a lot of hiking around helena there's a lot of these over by mount helena and uh kind of up that up by reader's alley that's just a, a place that i used as kind of a hiking point a lot so that's what i have for a good reference but uh, the wax current ribes cerium uh, they're they're shorter. They're very drought tolerant. Uh, not quite as drought tolerant as the antelope bitter brush, but quite close. So they're very hardy. Uh, they get the showy red berries on them. They grow well in rock gardens, rocky soils. They attract the the hummingbirds, especially the rufous hummingbird. They're just a, a very good plant to have. Um, there are a couple of diseases that can affect the currents that are usually transferred by aphids. And uh, I'll touch a little bit more on that on the next plant actually. But uh, they get showy flowers. And this one, the, the wax current gets its name because it's kind of got a waxy leaf, but the berries aren't palatable. They're edible, but they're just not good from every, every uh, account that I read. I haven't tried these ones myself, but I've tried the next ones, which are the golden current. And it looks very similar, but it gets the blackberries, purple blackberries, uh, similar growing conditions, similar growth habits, gets its name from the bright yellow golden flowers that it has. And again, not exactly the best picture, but you can see that it gets a lot of flowers across the whole plant. And this one is quite tasty and useful because the berries are edible, but they're very tart, just like choke cherries and service berries. But, the Native Americans, I believe they also used these for the pemmican, just like the other berries. But the flowers are said to have a, a wide array of scents, including cloves and vanilla. And I, I can't say as I picked that scent up myself, but I would love to find more examples of it and keep smelling them because it's always good to stop and smell the flowers. But it has a lot of other common names. Uh, so some of them are buffalo current, fragrant current, fragrant golden current, clove current, and spice bush. And I think spice bush is just a fun name. But uh, so the disease I had mentioned, it's a particularly devastating disease for some of our other native plants. It is called white pine blister rust. And it's a, a fungal rust disease that it manifests as little growths on this plant, but then it can actually completely wipe out uh, varieties of white pines. So that's like the western white pine, the sugar pine, limber pine, and white bark pine. And uh, kind of a, a quick and easy rule for the most part is any five-needled pine is probably susceptible to, this, to the disease. And so there was actually an effort to remove a lot of golden currents from the general ecosystem, and wax currents for that matter, uh, to reduce the loss of those white pines. But they're making kind of a resurgence in the urban landscape because the white pines are a little bit less popular in the urban landscape. So this might be a good option for, you know, if if you or your neighbors don't have a white pine and you want a berry bush that's hardy as can be, it, it might be a good option for planting in in your yard. I know I, I certainly love the, the flavor of currants. When I was over in England, they have a lot of black currant flavored everything. And it's a fantastic flavor that's kind of lacking in the U.S. because we did such an effort to get rid of the black currants and golden currants. So next up, pretty pretty standard one is a very hardy rose. If you've ever heard someone that said roses are too picky and they just can't grow them, then they should try a woods rose because these are just hardy as can be. They're a shorter rose. They're definitely not as showy as like a hybrid tea rose. They get that single layered flower, but they're so hardy, they get a lot of those flowers. It's a native rose, not really a reason to not go with them. And they are very thorny. And I put thorny there in quotation marks because roses don't really have thorns. They have what are called prickles. And the difference is a thorn has vascular tissue because it's a modified branch, whereas a prickle is modified bark, basically. So we've all heard the, you know, the famous song from the 80s from, uh, I think it's Poison, Every Rose Has Its Thorn. Uh, it's not exactly true. Great song, but uh, it's not not quite there. The science isn't there for rock music. But uh, the hips of the ro the roses, the fruits, are quite usable for tea. They're eaten fresh. They get little hairs in them, so you have to kind of be careful of how you prepare them. 
But uh, one other particular fun thing, if you're a plant nerd like myself here, the subspecies of the rose in this picture is ultra Montana. And I just think that sounds so fun. It's ultra Montana. It's very Montana rose. Uh, they have a lot of the other common names that they use for them is common wild rose, mountain rose, pear hip rose, prairie rose, pretty much anything that sounds like Montana with rose stuck on it. And uh, for a lot of the grafted roses that you can buy in nurseries, this is actually the rootstock that they use for those. So that's part of what makes other roses so hardy is that they base them on this rose, which is just a kind of a fun add on to them even. So the, the woods rose, it's a good, good local rose. This one is a particularly interesting plant, the snowberry. And uh, you've similar areas to the Rocky Mountain juniper and the wax current. They're very popular over by the, the Reader's Alley, Reader's Village area. They're very hardy. They grow particularly well under other trees, very low growing. They do like a bit more water, but again, they tolerate Montana conditions. Uh, they'll sucker and fill in hedges and everything. They're, they get really dark green foliage that really stands out against other, it's almost got a bluish hue to it. So it stands out with other plants, even in the middle of summer. And then as they produce their flowers, you can see there's one kind of open at the bottom there. They get a really pretty pink flower that accents the bright white berries. And that's where they get the name snowberry. And uh, their, their genus name, Symphoricarpus, means to bear fruit together. So as you can see, they, they grow them in very tight clumps right at the end of the branches. So that's a, a pretty good uh, description of them from Latin. And this is one of the plants that I had mentioned before that Meriwether Lewis, on his first trip through, identified that it's in the honeysuckle family. And he said that it was, you know, he said it was related to the honeysuckles. And sure enough, they're still in that same family today. So that's pretty interesting. And uh, these have become a very popular landscape plant in Eastern Europe over the years. And they've kind of become naturalized over there. But an interesting thing is they're grown on farms and communes over there as a lotion or a hand balm. So the farm workers would take the berries and crush them up in their hands and just kind of rub it all over and it would kind of work as a hand balm, you know, kind of ease sores and everything. And I'd never thought of that use, but I've handled the berries and broken the berries open before. And it sure enough does have kind of that slightly soothing lotion effect to it. So that's just kind of a interesting little tidbit there. And this is the last specific plant I'm gonna cover in this talk, just cause there's, there's way too many to choose from. So this was just kind of a top list, but this is the trilobe sumac. And it's also known as skunk bush, skunk brush, anything along those lines. It's very low growing. It gets a remarkable fall color. It gets that stark red that you can see in that lower right picture. And uh, they tolerate all kinds of soils. You can, you know, basically grow this out of crushed up sheetrock. They do fantastic. But uh, there's a lot of great examples uh, up by the Capitol in the older parts of town and, and over at MSU. They've got it in a lot of landscape beds there. But it gets showy little uh, yellow flowers, grows them in tight little bundles. Uh, it's got pretty neat looking leaves. Uh, it says grows up to four feet, but I can't say as I've ever seen one over two. They're usually pretty low growing. Uh, and it, it gets the name skunk bush, skunk brush, because a lot of people, and I've had a lot of different people tell me this, that if you break the leaves, it smells like a skunk. And I've broken probably more than my fair share of leaves trying to find that effect and I've never found it myself so I'm, I don't know if I'm just unable to pick up on the scent or if I'm just getting ones that they've selectively bred that out of or something but I don't know why I'm actively seeking out a skunk scent but I find it fascinating but they are a very nice showy hardy uh, very low maintenance uh, shrub for growing in the, the urban landscape and so with that that's all the species I have specifically listed. So if there's any questions, comments, or concerns, uh, you can voice them here, or you can send me an email. There's my uh, government email address. I can consider that government work. And uh, on the left side here, are a couple of pictures of when I took a vacation over to England. I actually see that one of them is my background right now too. 
but uh, the Royal Botanical Gardens. And uh, on the top right there, you might notice is a prickly pear. It's not exactly our same species of prickly pear, but just kind of a small point of local pride that, hey, they even grow those pokey little cactus over there. And the bottom right is one of the pictures from when I was a groundskeeper over at Spring Meadow State Park. Carson, we do have a, a comment and a question. Ooh. The comment was from the first um, slide that you put up of our backyard. Mm -hmm. And they said all they saw was snow. I don't see the mountain ash, only snow. Ah, okay. Well, let me... I think it, they didn't realize it was just past our fence. Yeah, let me see how I share the slide again here. And uh, screen share, share that one. Okay, and I can put up my little, there's a laser pointer built into this. So right, this right awesome. here is the, uh, it's a showy mountain ash, I think is the variety, but it's based on the Western mountain ash, the little bit taller growing one. And actually you can see right there is one of the Plains Cottonwoods. Normally Mount Helena is right about here, but uh, right. snowstorm. <laughs> it, it was snowing pretty hard that day. And um, Nature Park is right over here for us. So. Right there. Yeah, it's just over the cars. That's Nature Park. Yeah. <laughs> so now that you all know where I live, too. <laughs> and the next question is it had to do with that champion cottonwood near hamilton they want to know where they can find it they'd like to see it okay um let's see it was early last summer that i was down there i think it's just southeast of town you can actually go i think it's on the uh isa arborist website or maybe it's on the NRCS, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture and Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, one of those sites, they have all of the U.S. champion trees listed, and it's just outside of Hamilton there. But I, I think if you just search for the Populus deltoides variety monolifera and then U.S. champion, it, it should give, I think they have GPS coordinates even as to where it is. That's cool. We're getting more questions. All right. One said they imagine that most of these native shrubs are palatable to deer. Any <laughs> tips on deer management? Just fencing shrubs for the winter? Um, you know, deer is always, it's such a specific pest that here at the department, we actually have a vertebrate pest specialist. And that's one of the things he mostly talks about. Um, kind of the, yeah, ex exclusion is the best way to go for deer management. Um, a lot of those repellent sprays will work for a little while and then if the deer are desperate enough they'll just go right in anyway so yeah fencing things like that is probably the best way to go i know that um i have planted some lilacs uh, that i have gotten uh you know i harvested them from other people's plants and i've had to literally put fences or cages around them we have a huge um urban deer population here in Helena. We have someone that said great information. Thank you. And, and another thanks. And thanks, Carson. And OK, here's a, a question. I have choke cherries in my yard. All bloom very nicely, and a few produce fruit. A large old hedge of them, despite lots of flowers, produces next to no fruit. And I don't recall any in over 40 years ever producing a ripe fruit. Any ideas what might be the cause of that? Hmm, um, that, it could be nutrient deficiency. Uh, and I said that native plants usually have fewer inputs required, but if it's been there for that long, it could be that it's just kind of used up certain nutrients in the soil. Uh, a lot of plants will need a decent supply of phosphorus to produce enough fruit. Um, it could be that. It could be maybe inadequate pollination, but if it's a large enough hedge, I kind of doubt that. Uh, yeah, I don't know for 100% sure, but my guess would be nutrients as, as a first shot. 
And as a state uh, employee, you can't recommend a particular product for them. I, I can't recommend specific products or nurseries, but uh, I, I can give it, I can guide you to Google pretty well. I can give you the search words. <laughs> <laughs> and they followed up that question with thanks, a great program. I I don't see any new questions. So I think maybe we might be done. All right. Well, what do you think, Bob. Where is Bob? <laughs>